I'm making friends in a new town and I head over to a buddy's apartment and I see that they have a cat that looks like Garfield. I go to another friend's place and they have not one, but two cute doggos in their apartment. I go to another friend's house and they have a cat and dog living harmoniously together and when they snuggle up with each other, it is so cute. I asked my buddy how he met his girlfriend and he says he met her on a dating app called Hinge. I download it and while I'm developing arthritis in my finger from swiping all the time, I notice something. So many people have a dog or cat. They have cute pictures with them, they mention them in their profile, and it looks like they're an important part of their life. It gets me thinking, how many people have pets? I Google it and find out that according to the American Pet Products Association, 70% of households in the United States own one or more pets in 2020, and we spend $100 billion on pets every year. Why all the pets? Hi, I'm Yusuf, and I question. Today, I'm exploring pets. What's the origin of pets? What are their positives? What are their not so positives? Is it ethical to own a pet? And I'm going to share my own thoughts too. Strap on in and join the ride with me. The origin of pets. Dogs are the first animals to be domesticated. Fossils point to a relationship between humans and gray wolves around 10 to 30,000 years ago. Some theorize early human hunter-gatherers actively tamed and bred wolves. Others say wolves domesticated themselves by scavenging the carcasses left by human hunters or loitering around campfires, growing tamer with each generation until they became permanent companions. Archaeologist and geneticist Gregor Larson believes that the domestication of wolves into dogs has been a vital source of human development. He even says, remove domestication from the human species and there's probably a couple million of us on the planet max. Wolves have been used to help us hunt and to protect our farm animals. In return, we fed them and gave them a warm place to sleep at night. This created a relationship between people and beasts. As time went on, through continuous breeding and artificial selection of more docile traits, somewhere along the way, the wolf species diverged and the modern dog was brought into existence. The origin of cats and humans is a fascinating one. Some of the earliest indications that cats have become part of human society comes from the ancient Egyptians. Cats were represented in social and religious practices of ancient Egypt for more than 3,000 years. Several ancient Egyptian deities were depicted and sculptured with cat-like heads such as Mafdet, Bastet, and Sakmet, representing justice, fertility, and power. Cats are featured in hieroglyphics, and they were mummified and buried along with their pharaoh lords. Among common folk, cats were kept around farms because of their keen ability to hunt rodents and fend off snakes, allowing humans to keep food for longer periods of time to help in their survival. But unlike dogs, it's debated as to whether cats are even domesticated. Wes Warren, PhD Associate Professor of Genetics at the Genome Institute at Washington University in St. Louis, states, We don't think they are truly domesticated, says Warren, who prefers to refer to cats as semi-domesticated. Regardless of the domestication, cats are the second most popular pets right after dogs. Modern pet keeping. Dogs and cats were used for utility and seen as working animals. This continued for thousands of years until the Victorian era rolled around. Pet keeping in its present form is probably a 19th century Victorian invention. At this time, it was perceived as a link with the natural world, which itself was no longer seen as threatening. It also allowed a visible demonstration of man's domination over nature. And the practice of pet keeping in Victorian times also reflected other social attitudes of the time. Pet keeping was not considered appropriate for the lower classes, as it was thought to encourage the neglect of other social duties. This is the beginning of the modern pet, where animals go from being a utility to becoming part of the family, and it continues like this to this day. Story time. Story time! I've lived with two cats in my life. The first was when I was growing up. My sister had a white Turkish Angora cat that we named Cookie. She was beautiful and deaf. Every day when we would have lunch together as a family, the dining room was on the ground floor. And sometimes we would hear Cookie meowing because she was looking for us on the upper floor. One of us kids would have to run over to the stairs and flicker the lights. And Cookie would see the lights flickering and know that we were downstairs. Then she would run all the way downstairs and sit beside us because we always had a little chair for her to sit on. She would sit beside us and chill out and be around us while we were eating. She loved being around us, but the funny thing is she didn't like being pet. In fact, if you pet her too much, she would swat at you. And one funny thing is that she only drank water from the sink. We would have to put the water on the sink at a really low volume and it would be almost dripping. And she would tilt her head and just be like, 
the whole time to drink water. It was so cute. <laughs> The positives of pets. Animals help humans. Dogs have a natural pack mentality. They guard and protect their owners. They alert them of danger. They'll bark when someone's approaching your house, even when they're far away because of their superior to human hearing abilities. Pets are a great way to teach children responsibility and love. They have to feed them, walk them, and take care of them. And that teaches them important life lessons and skills. Dogs help humans hunt with their excellent hearing and smell that's better than humans. Although this may have been more important tens of thousands of years ago. Closer to modern times, hunting dogs have been used more for sport rather than necessity. Dogs help humans herd livestock. They can command and move large herds of ducks, sheep, or even cows to assist farmers. If you ever seen the movie Babe, you know all about this. Dogs can be assistance animals that help the elderly or disabled. But according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Development, they are not pets. Police dogs aren't seen as pets either, but they help people in many ways like sniffing out drugs, bomb detectives, finding people in search and rescue operations, and assisting in apprehension of criminals. But one could argue that we're putting the life of the dog on the line instead of a human's. Animals are wonderful companions. Humans are social. We desire to be around others, and pets can help fill the role of companionship with an added bonus of them making you feel good in a number of ways. An extensive number of studies in a wide range of journals and disciplines support that interactions with pets contribute to good health and quality of life and healing from serious illness illness and conditions. Pets can influence our emotional state our sense of security and acceptance, and even our positive outlook on life. Dogs and cats can sense when you're feeling down, and they can give you little hugs and snuggles to make you feel better. That can cheer you up. Pets can be emotional support animals. An emotional support animal is an animal that can provide emotional and therapeutic benefit to those suffering with emotional issues, anxiety, or psychiatric problems. Dogs can help you stay physically fit. They need daily walks to stay healthy, and that means you got to go out there and run with them, so that's going to help keep you fit and healthy. Story, Story time. time. When I moved in with the previous partner, she had a gray striped cat named Fiona. The best way I can describe her is that she's the most docile cat you can ever think of. She was so chill and never knocked anything off of a table, not even one time. She would go crazy for the laser pointer when you would play with her with it. She would just like dart all around the apartment and just have so much fun. Sometimes even jumping up on the wall to get it. Like it's crazy. <laughs> Every time we would come home, she would lay on the floor, stretch out her body and roll around while purring profusely. It was super cute and it made me feel like she was saying, hi, welcome home. She wasn't a big fan of being pet and I completely respected that, but my ex-girlfriend loved petting her. That's why I think Fiona would always come and sit beside me when I was on the computer or would lay on me while I was playing video games or even when I'm playing guitar, she would just love to come and lay on me. <laughs> that would make her jelly but it was cute. The not so positives of pet and animal ownership. Animal obsession. There's people out there that love their animals a little too much. They need them by their side at all times. At home, they have free reign to do whatever they want. Sleep on the couch, sleep on the bed, sleep anywhere they want. Whenever the owner goes out, they wanna take their pet with them. It's more socially acceptable to take your dog out with you, but anecdotally speaking, I've been seeing a lot of people taking their cats out on leashes nowadays. Speaking of leashes, are those ethical? I'll get into that in the next section of the video. This obsession can get in the way of human relationships. Dogs can become an impediment to and a substitution for intimacy and frequently incite jealousy among couples since it's often easier to express unambivalent love for a dog rather than a human. All the affection that the person is not giving to you, the dog is getting. That becomes in a way the more intense emotional relationship. That's bad, and it's very easy for that to happen. Animal hoarding is a real thing. We throw around the term crazy cat lady, but in real life, there are people who hoard animals. There are people who compulsively need to collect and own animals for the sake of caring for them that results in accidental or unintentional neglect or abuse, and at least 250,000 animals are affected each year. 80% of animal hoarders have diseased, dying, or dead animals on the premises. Animal unpredictability. For as much as we want to believe that our little Fido is the sweetest puppy in the world, when you take your doggo outside, it's actually illegal to walk your dog without a leash 
leash on in most states. Not having your dog on a leash can have real dangers, including dogs are able to get into physical confrontations and hurt each other. Dogs are able to approach people and potentially hurt them, even if by jumping on them. Dogs can harm or kill wildlife in the area. Dogs are able to run into the road and cause injury to themselves and other people. Destruction of property is more common. Dogs are more likely to dig in private or public spaces or spread trash around and chew property. There are wild animal instincts in our puppers that we have to control by keeping them on a leash. One thing to keep in mind is that if they do any property damage or hurt anyone, the owner is legally liable for it, whether that's paying medical bills or even being legally sued for any harm your doggo does. Cats can be unpredictable in the wild too. It's more socially acceptable to allow your cat to go outdoors compared to dogs. The Central California SPCA warns of the dangers of letting your cat go outside, such as they attack or are attacked by other animals. They can hunt birds and other small animals that threaten wildlife. They have turf wars with cats. They mate with other cats. They can catch diseases or ticks. Accidents can happen to them, most commonly being run over by a vehicle. No matter how much we think we have our pets in control, they have wild instincts in them that can cause harm to others or themselves. The destructiveness of humans. Sadly, there are certain breeds of dogs who have been systematically bred by humans for the specific purpose of violence. One of the most popular of these breeds is the pit bull type dogs, including American pit bull terriers, American Staffordshire terriers, and pit mixes. They typically have all the same characteristics of other dogs including love, companionship, and protection, but it's amplified. The American Pit Bull Terrier has been selectively bred for hundreds of years to fight other dogs. Even in dogs that are not recently bred from fighting lines, the urge to rumble can arise at any time. Not to strongly emphasize this fact is to be negligent. It's not the fault of these breeds that they're like this. The blame is on people, but most people downplay or are negligent of their capabilities, which leads to unfortunate actions. Accidents. A phrase that I've personally heard is, not my pit bull. It takes an incredibly loving, understanding, and responsible person to care for this type of breed and others who have been bred for hurt. But too many people buy them specifically because of their association with violence and continue to raise them with those traits that will continue down their bloodline. When you own a breed like this, it can cause apprehension and anxiety from friends and family, no matter how well you have trained the dog. Animal shelters. For every home with a happy pet, there are millions of animals out there in animal shelters. Approximately 6.3 million companion animals enter U.S. animal shelters nationwide every year. 3.1 million are dogs and 3.2 million are cats. The main reasons animals are in shelters is that owners give them up or animal control finds them on the street. What happens when these these beautiful animals aren't adopted. Providing the food and shelter needed for so many animals costs too much money. So sadly, approximately 920,000 shelter animals are euthanized every year. Environment. It may not be the first thing that you think of when you're snuggling a kitten in your palm, but pets impact the environment. Meat eating by dogs and cats creates the equivalent of about 64 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, which has about the same climate impact as a year's worth of driving from 13.6 million cars. Cats and dogs are responsible for 25 to 30 percent of the environmental impact of meat consumption in the United States. Having pets, unfortunately, affects the environment. Puppy mills. Have you ever asked yourself, where do the puppies that are sold at pet stores come from? The answer is puppy mills, an inhumane high volume dog breeding facility that churns out puppies for profit, ignoring the needs of the pups and their mothers. 4.3 million puppies are born in mills every year, where a mother dog's entire life is continuous breeding and when she can't breed anymore, she's killed. These dogs are kept in cages, only half of the puppies born in these mills survive past 12 weeks, and excluding breeding animals, as many as 2 million dogs die in puppy mills every year. They euthanize them by drowning, shooting, or gassing them with improvised gas chambers. It isn't just puppies. There are kitten mills, rabbit mills, bird mills, and more. The pet stores that sell these animals have to meet the demand of society, but it's sad to think that so many of them die or are disposed of in the process. Are pets ethical? 
Is it fair to say that the byproduct of human want is millions of animals locked up in shelters and the hundreds of thousands of animals euthanized every year? Is the animal industrial complex to blame? Are people to blame? Have we considered that animals don't have the ability to get a say in whether they want to be a pet or not? We can't ask them if they're happy, sad, want to live in an apartment, a house, or in the wild. Humans anthropomorphize animals, projecting our human emotions and feelings onto them. One example of this is when people think dogs are smiling. It's very possible that we misinterpret what we see on dogs' faces. In fact, there's very little objective research to support the idea that dogs smile. This particular expression, called relaxed open mouth in dogs, typically occurs in positive settings, like when dogs are inviting one another to play. But whether it's really what we would call a smile or whether dogs are directing it at us intentionally to communicate something remains unknown. How can we start having a conversation about whether animals are happy or not in their pet conditions when we don't even know if they're smiling or not. Personally speaking, I have criticisms when it comes to control, and there's a lot of control when it comes to pets. Control over when they eat, what they eat, what they can do, where they can go. We even control their movement when they're outside. Most states make it illegal to have your dog outside without a leash. Can we consider a leash a type of movement prison? It's for the animal's safety and the safety of other people, but at the cost of an animal's freedom. To be fair, when you take them to a dog park, you can take them off the leash so they can run around in a fenced environment. Speaking of, we typically keep pets in enclosed environments. I know this is a hot take, but consider the definition of a prisoner, a person deprived of liberty and kept under involuntary restraint, confinement, or custody. The similarity is striking if you replace the word human with animal. We deprive them of their liberty by keeping them in our homes and on a leash when outside. One could argue it's involuntary because we can't ask consent from the animal and we can find them in spaces. An extreme case of this is when owners lock their dogs up in a cage when they leave their homes. Hot take number two. Take a moment to consider the definition of a slave. A person who is the legal property of another and is forced to obey them. The similarity is striking if you replace Place the word person with animal. Did you know that according to current United States law, animals are classified as property? But I do want to point out that most pro-animal rights activist organizations don't like this classification. And animals are forced to obey their humans. We give pets commands. One of the most popular ones, which I personally have always found strange and demeaning, is when we tell them to sit or roll over. Dogs are trained to obey their masters. And while some cats can be trained, they pretty much have a mind of their own. By the way, did you know that cats only meow to humans and not to other cats? Cats meow to greet humans, get attention, and ask for food. And unlike dogs who know an answer to their name, cats don't recognize their names. Cats learn to tell the difference between different sounds, but there's no evidence to show that they have a concept of their name in the way that humans do. Basically, cats do their own thing. <laughs> Dogs, cats, and birds are the most common types of pets in the United States. But who decides what counts as a pet and what doesn't? It's social taboo in the United States to eat cats and dogs. But in countries like China and Switzerland, it's socially acceptable. It is an old tradition in Switzerland to eat dog meat like sausages and use dog fat for rheumatism. People eat cats because they taste like rabbits. Did you know it is illegal to sell dog or cat meat in the United States, but 44 states allow its personal consumption? Why do we say no to eating dogs or cats, but yes to certain birds like chickens and pigeons, or even cows or pigs? But why we eat animals is beyond the discussion of this video, which is focused on pets. I think that we choose certain animals to be pets because of how cute they look. Have you ever noticed most animals we keep as pets are smaller than us? Could this be one of the characteristics of a pet and why we choose dogs, cats, and birds rather than bears, giraffes, or rhinos? Research backs this up, actually. Dozens of studies show that the smaller and more stereotypically baby a human or animal looks, the more we want to protect it. One investigation found that seeing pictures of baby animals makes us smile, while another discovered that photos of human infants trigger the nucleus acumens, a brain region implicated in the anticipation of a reward. Even less common pets like rabbits, snakes, fish, and bearded dragons, to name a few, are all smaller than human beings. Could it be that one classification of a pet 
is that it has to be smaller than us? Why are we okay with keeping pets in environments that they weren't made for? I think the Husky is the most beautiful dog breed, especially when they have heterochromia or two different eye colors. But seeing someone walking a Husky outside in Texas when it's 40 degrees Celsius outside? Yeah, I'm not sure about that because Huskies can live in conditions of negative 50 degrees Celsius. Is it humane to raise a pet in an environment that it's not naturally accustomed to? One overlooked aspect of owning a pet is the cost. The total estimated annual cost for owning a dog is $380 to $1,170, and the total estimated annual cost for owning a cat is $430 to $870. Personally, I don't think that this is expensive, but when every dollar counts, is it a good idea to have a pet? Anecdotally speaking, I've met a number of people who own more than one pet who live paycheck to paycheck. What if a major expense pops up like a car repair bill or a medical bill? Will the owner be able to take care of themselves and will they be able to take care of their animal when money is tight? My take. After doing all this reading and research, I feel like having a pet is unethical. From everything I talked about in this video, the reason that pokes out the most is because owning a pet is humanly selfish. We selfishly took these beautiful animals out of the wild and domesticated them to use them for our own physical or emotional needs. Through artificial selection, we breed traits that suit human wants and needs the best, not what's best for the animal. Animal breeders breed millions of animals every year to meet the demands of pet ownership. And when they aren't adopted, hundreds of thousands of millions are killed or euthanized. There's millions of animals in shelters because of abandonment and neglect. While we have good intentions and it's always best to adopt from shelters, it isn't getting to the core of the issue. Humans have created the system because they want animals as pets. How can we solve this? Telling someone to free their pet is in a solution. It's gotten to the point of no return where even if we free our pets, they wouldn't survive because of their dependency on humans. If you find all these facts tragic like I do and want to do something, I think one way is to reduce pet ownership. If you have a pet right now, continue loving them. Give them a warm place to sleep every night and love them with all of your heart. And when it's their time to go and they naturally pass, cherish their memory with love. One thing that has always stuck out to me as odd that's common for when an owner loses a pet, typically through old age and natural causes, the pet owner will go out and get a new one, a replacement. Sometimes within the same week, the previous pet passed away. Personally, I don't think I could do that. When you spend 10 plus years with an animal and love them so much, getting a new one so quickly feels like you're just replacing them and changing it out for a new model. Like they didn't mean much. Things we can stop today. There are certain things that are happening today that we can stop right now that would make the world a better place. One is paying any ML for a pet. This will eliminate or reduce the incentive for for-profit companies to have animal mills. Putting a price tag on pure breeds or certain physical characteristics is dystopian to me, but it exists today. Make pets adoption only. Another is ending animal shows. For example, the National Dog Show. People arbitrarily judge dogs for their physical characteristics and abilities. This creates a market where people are paying bucket loads of money for purebred animals. One of the dogs in the litter is what they're looking for, but if the others aren't, they see the same fate as unwanted puppies from puppy mills. Also, a common way to get a purebred dog is through inbreeding, and that causes health issues that are passed down for generations. The term purebred is questionable at best. How far back do records go? How is this stuff authenticated? It just feeds into the animal industrial complex and I can't help feel like it's all malarkey. Another thing I think that we should stop doing today and what I find weird are these pet influencer accounts, social media accounts completely dedicated to a single animal. I'm surprised that internet companies even allow this kind of thing because it is exploitative. The owners are profiting off of the cuteness of their animal. I I completely understand when you post your cute pet on your social media account every now and again sharing their cuteness to the world, but these types of social media channels take it to a completely new level that I do not think is ethical at all. Conclusion. It is difficult for me to accept that owning a pet is ethical, but where pets are today is complex. I strongly agree with these statements from a Guardian article on the ethics of pet ownership. We do have pets and giving them up 
might cause more harm than good. It has already been decided by market forces and human nature. The reality is people have pets in the millions. The question is, how can we help them care for them correctly and appropriately? This aligns with my personal mantra of love and acceptance. If you already own a pet, continue taking care of it with all of your heart. If you don't have a pet, consider that if you love these animals, it may not be in their best interest to own one as a pet. I personally choose not to own a pet, but I stand for personal autonomy and won't judge a person for owning one. I for one will continue petting cute puppies and kittens only after I ask the permission of the owner, even though I'm allergic to both cats and dogs. Outro! Thank you so much for joining me in exploring the ethics of pet ownership. I would love to hear your thoughts on the subject, so feel free to leave a comment. Sources are in the description. If you want to support me in doing more videos of that question, I have a Ko-fi, a Patreon alternative where you can subscribe to me monthly or you can send me a one-time donation. I have a goal where if we reach $400 a month, I'll donate half the amount every month to classrooms in need via donors choose. Plus, members get other cool perks that you can read about on the Kofi page. Thank you very much for watching.